Well, in case you didn't know, in case you didn't know, the prophetic world is a buzz with powerful and uh, 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 most amazing information now. Uh, the most amazing revelation, I think, in years concerning uh, the coming of Christ and the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Because John Hagee has declared three things, the way I break it down. Number one, the man of sin is alive today. That's what he says. The man of sin is alive today. Number two, and most shockingly, He will be revealed to the world on August 30th this year. And number three, the war of Gog and Magog is already underway. Which makes me... That's what he said. So these are his declarations. Now you go over the internet and the, the prophetic end times sites, you know of which is the, there's an endless number of them, they're all asking the question about August 30th, 2016. The man of sin is alive. And he's on the verge. I mean, he's on the verge of being revealed. This summer, August 30th. Very specific. Well, <clears throat> so I was going to continue in my thoughts on Jeremiah. We were talking about Jeremiah. And I thought, well, let's keep pushing forward. But, you know, looking, I had heard that he had said that a few weeks ago, and, well, you know, let me start looking. Then I saw it all over the place. I thought, this is ridiculous. So I said, well, let me speak to it. And uh, the more I went into it, the more it, it just, it's shocking to me, the current condition of Christianity. I have to say, it is very embarrassing. I feel embarrassed in front of unbelievers. I don't know what they're associating us with, but certainly I don't want to be associated with John Hagee. First of all, John Hagee has a history of false predictions. It seems like an endless sea of false predictions, false predictions that are premised upon his false theology, dispensational, pre-tribulational, premillennialism. That's the root of his problem. Now, he will still take that problem and make more problems, as they all do. But he makes even more because he has other things going against him by how he's thinking and approaching Scripture. For instance, he just gave us the four blood moons. The four blood moons, the four blood moons, the four blood moons. Books were written. People were wowed. He had a movie made. Books and movies. How much money did that character make? off of this uh, four blood moon scenario. I don't know. You know, they've been talking about carnival barkers because of Trump. You know, that all of a sudden, oh, that old phrase, carnival barker. So they apply it to Trump. Well, I think we have a sluggish carnival barker for Christian Zionism and dispensationalism amongst us. Not amongst us, but that would be John Hagee. And how much money he made off the foolishness of this whole blood moon thing, I just hate to think about it. John Hagee connected the four blood moons, which would go from April of 2014 to September of 2015. And between April of 2014 and September of 2015, a whole bunch of things were supposed to happen. That was the blood moon, the four blood moon phases. And during this time period, we were told that Joel chapter 2 would be fulfilled. Well, I got news for him. Peter tells us it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Now, if he doesn't like it, and he wants to change it because it doesn't fit fit his um, hermeneutics that he learned at wherever he learned it from, too bad for him, I agree with Peter. You better adjust your theology to agree with the, the doctrine of the apostles. So he says that uh, <laughs> between 2014 and 2015, Joel 2 would be fulfilled. Well, that didn't happen, the way he would look at it. He said that Mark 13 would, would be fulfilled in that time frame. You say, what's that a reference to? Well, I don't even want to get into it. But he said it would happen. It didn't happen. Go look it up yourself. It's too boring to talk about. 
He said that the battle of Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 would happen during the blood moons, April of 2014 to September of 2015. The battle of Gog and Magog did not happen then. Now he's telling us it's happening right now. And the other day I turned on TV. You know, we've got some empty chairs. He doesn't have an empty chair. He's busting at the seams in that massive coliseum of his. And he lies. He gives false predictions. They're proven 100% flat out false. And it seems more people show up the next week. Are they Christians? Christians have a renewed mind. And to varying degrees, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, they're given a measure of discernment or there's no Holy Spirit. It's a measure. It can vary. We can backslide. We can have... But it seems like these characters grow the more they lie. So, I don't know. The Battle of Gog and Magog was supposed to happen. Then it didn't. He said that the return of Christ and the rapture would take place during the four blood moons between August 2014 and September 2015. Christ would return and rapture his church. It didn't happen, brethren. Now, he, I saw a thing where he tried to wiggle out of it, like after the fact. So, John Hagee, you're a big fat liar. What do you say? They didn't quite raise it that way, but that's you know the essence of it. And what a, what a slimy answer he had. It was like, well, I technically, in all those statements he made, like he would be preaching on the four blood moons, and he'd say, and brethren, and when this happens, and this is going to be fulfilled in Bible prophecy, he goes, when this happens in the four blood, he goes, then lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. We didn't say the second coming of Christ was happening, or the rapture of the church, but that's what... <sighs> Unbelievable. And he said during the four blood moons there would be a one world government of Antichrist and that didn't happen. The specifics he would spell out during that time period between August, um, uh, April of 2014 and September of 2015. Israel would attack the nuclear sites of Iran. He said that's what's going to happen. Didn't happen. He said that Russia was going to lead an alliance of Arab Spring nations to invade Israel, which is, by the way, the Gog and Magog thing. He's just describing it with specifics. You can say it theologically, Gog and Magog, or you can, what does that mean? And they would say that means Russia with an alliance of certain Arab nations, and he was saying it was the Arab Spring nations, going to come down and uh, they're going to invade Israel. But that didn't happen in 2014 and 2015. And... He said that God would destroy Russia and Iran during that time frame. None of it happened. He put it in print. He preached it from his pulpit. It went on YouTube. They made a movie about it. And he was raking in the money. And all the skeptics who are looking for excuses to not believe the Bible because they want to go off and do their sin, they don't want... God sovereign over their conscience or anything like that. So every time he does things like that, then when it's all over, see, they're confirmed in denying the Bible. It's no small thing to say, thus saith the Lord, and it wasn't true. How much harm are you doing to people who maybe aren't, you know, antagonistic agnostics who want to make fun of us? They'll use it. So the enemies of Christ will blaspheme. But then there are those who are a little more innocent. And they weren't raised in a Christian environment, and they don't know much about the Bible. And maybe when when they hear something about the gospel, their conscience is pricked a little. But they haven't crossed that line. And then they wonder, well, you know, all my friends and stuff say you can't trust the Bible. But I do. I feel like that maybe there's something to it. And then this happens, and they observe it, and they think, well, maybe this is going to show it. I I, I knew when I heard John 3.16, it convicted me. And I, I, I'm i some of these Christians, I do feel like the Lord. And then they, they, they're they actually believing John, and the, their friends maybe are following John Hagee, or whether they are or not. But, and then it never happens. And the conviction they had from the gospel goes away. It's not a small thing. 
Now, here's a question. How does John Hagee get to August 30th, 2016, as the specific day in which the man of sin is revealed? Pay careful attention. Here's my answer. How does he get to that date? Here's my answer. Who cares? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not going any further with it than that. Because that's to argue at the peripheral edge, which is almost to be sucked into it. No, no, no. We don't even have to address that. Let me, at a more basic level, at a more fundamental level, uh, refute the very premise of his basic eschatological scheme, which is necessary for him to come to these uh, crazy conclusions. The details and the specifics of his greasy musings <laughs> are easy enough to refute, but I'm not going to slip into that. Uh, I'd rather put the axe to the root. You know, why talk about the details when you can put the axe to the root? So I say, let's put the axe to the root, the very foundation upon which his money-making scheme is built, just like it was with Tim LaHaye and his money-making scheme. Now, if you want to understand the man of sin, because that's his subject matter, he's alive now, he's going to be revealed on August 30th, the Battle of Gog and Magog has already taken place. Which means the rapture is, I mean, could be before I say my next word. But it has to be pretty quick, see? Particularly because these men believe in pre-trib rapture. So there's going to be a rapture. If we're listening to what he's saying, it's going to be a rapture before August 30th. Because the man of sin is going to be revealed. Now, if we want to understand the man of sin, this seems to be the centerpiece then, uh, you know, I mean, there's several places you can go. And some people separate the man of sin from the beast. And others will say the beast is the man of sin. I think from their camp, most of them will say the beast is the man of sin. All right. So there's di different places we can go. But I'm going to go to the one that's most prominent and, and looked at most often, and that's the text we read this morning, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Why don't we turn there? Second Thessalonians 2. Which we have covered in recent months. I don't know when it was. It may have been um, towards the end of last year for all I know. Um, we, talked about, we went through this text somewhat uh, in regards to showing Nero to be the man of sin. But my emphasis was See Nero. This is a more broad look at this text, as you will see. Um, and I think uh, if you want to understand the man of sin, then we look at this text, and pretty much all theological perspectives uh, will agree that the man of sin, referenced in Second Thessalonians chapter two, is uh, absolutely tied up with the tribulation. You don't separate the man of sin from the tribulation. In fact, the man of sin is often so often understood as the engine of the tribulation. He's the bad guy that's persecuting God's people. And most will believe and understand the man of sin to be one and the same as the beast of Revelation. So also we see him in Revelation, and of course you can go back to Daniel and all that. But what, I just want to look at Thessalonians uh, for this morning. And um, we, or, no matter what perspective you come from, you can be a pre-millennial, you can be post-millennial, you can be amillennial, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. Uh, you, you can be a preterist, you can be a partial preterist. And they're all going to agree on one thing. <clears throat> the man of sin is the centerpiece of the tribulation being described. Right? He's the bad guy doing the bad things, okay? And there's actually, in one sense, there's, there's three different kinds of tribulations. There's the tribulation that the men of sin brings upon the Lord's people, the Christians. And that's the, the general one we're thinking of. But then there's the tribulation that's at that same general time, the tribulation that 
Christ brings on the man of sin when he comes and consumes him in, in his wrath. And then there's the tribulation that the mystery Babylon brings on the Lord's people, because mystery Babylon is separate from the beast. Mystery Babylon brings a tribulation, and this is all at the same time, they're like all overlapping, on the Lord's people, in well, on, uh, on Jerusalem, well, on the Christians, <laughs> and then on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, which is the Lord bringing tribulation on his enemies and destroying Mystery Babylon. So there's like all these different phases of different kinds of tribulation that are all happening pretty much almost simultaneously within a few year period right in one time. And the whole thing is the tribulation, see? Uh, that's just the reality of it. You know, I'm breaking it down that way. You just don't hear people talk of it that way. Now, <clears throat> so while all, all groups admit that the man of sin is the centerpiece of the tribulation, um, most commentators miss, however, the timing of this tribulation, a timing that is the necessary conclusion of a belief in sola scriptura. Now, if confessions of faith by good and godly men in days gone by trumps sola scriptura, then you can reject this argument. But if sola scriptura brings us to a divergence from many confessions of faith, then, okay, then you've got to follow that light that God gives in his word. And I think you know what we ought to do as believers. But so many miss the timing of this. Um, the tribulation that is to be brought on God's people, the Christians, does not take place in our future as it is described in its immediate context of Scripture. And one can argue a second fulfillment, but that's another subject. The immediate context and intent uh, in its uh, fulfillment according to the Scripture is that this tribulation is not in the future, it's in our past. Um, and that's obvious by the injunctions and context of the book of Revelation, when we dated the book of Revelation and we saw the end caps of Revelation, and it's also brought out very plainly in many of the epistles, and it's brought out here in Thessalonians, which I'm going to keep it narrow, the argument, and uh, look at the context here. Um, <clears throat> so in order to read Second Corinthians 2, we have to understand it in the light of its context. Its context is chapter 1. Too many times Christians just go to Second Thessalonians 2 and they start reading it and they start using logic and reasoning, knowledge of other scriptures. They start deducing things and make coming to conclusions. But some of that you may find to be tempered if you read it in its context. And then it's also going to be tempted if you read it in the context of other parallel texts, like in Revelation. What is the, the time context of Revelation? These things make demand on one's conscience. You can ignore your conscience and play it safe with the masses, which is what most do. Or you can say, Lord, I will boldly believe your word, but I have to humble myself before it and submit to it. And that's just a horse of a different color. You know, it's just a lot of folks don't want to do that. Now, so I want to look at chapter 1 first, and we'll just go as far as we can with this. Uh, look at chapter 1, then we're going to go into chapter 2. I'm not going to take it painstakingly, you know, when, chapter 1 is not going to be a three-part sermon. I'm going to cover that in just a few minutes. But I want to look at it because it's the context of, of chapter 2. Verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the assembly of the Thessalonians, in God our Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace from God our Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, brethren, we have been going through the book of Acts in our adult uh, Wednesday night class. When Paul went to Thessalonica, he himself received great tribulation and persecution so that he had to hightail it out of there. Paul's already been under the persecution and tribulation that was at Thessalonica. Thessalonica is not the most pleasant place to be as a Christian. And we are not suggesting that the tribulation we're speaking of was limited to Thessalonica. But Paul's writing to Thessalonica, so he's talking about it as it is manifested there. See, so 
understand that. So they're noted for this persecution. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you. You would be not you and I. Paul may be thankful that you and I as believers exist all these years later, but this is a letter to the Thessalonians. Pay attention to the context. Who is writing? To whom is he writing? So when we look at uh, uh, pronouns and things like that, we've got to put them in their context. We are bound to, uh, uh, to thank God always for you, the Thessalonian believers, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Hmm. And the charity of every one of you toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the assemblies of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Now, I want to remind you of something. Chapter 2 is about the tribulation. He's already talking about tribulation in chapter 1. And you'll have to ask yourself a question. Are these two different tribulations? You'll have to ask yourself that. Maybe you don't have sufficient information to make that judgment yet. That's okay. But just, you know, tuck that in the back of your mind. Now, in verses 3 and 4, um, Paul commends in verse 3 uh, the faith of the Thessalonian believers. He says that their faith groweth exceedingly. Okay? Their faith is growing by leaps and bounds. It's Their faith is growing exceedingly. Question, why? Why is their faith growing so exceedingly? Well, why does faith get stronger and grow rapidly? Well, one basic cause is that it's tried. When your faith is tried and tested, if you're not on a sure foundation, you can be destroyed by it. And then, you know, you don't have root, you dry up and... You're gone. But for the large people, um, the, the seeds of persecution and tribulation, uh, they were like the watering of the plant. And the plant grew and flourished in the days of, days of persecution. Woe to Zion when Zion is at ease. It's when she's under persecution, she flees to the Lord for help. We're no different. And so the reason their faith was growing exceedingly is because they were under severe tribulation and persecution. And he says, and the charity of every one of you, they have to show charity. Why is, why is, he's commending them for the charity they show each other. Why is this strong love so profound and noted there? Because when you're under persecution, you cling together. And whatever differences or little grudges you hold, all are immediately dismissed because you've got a bigger thing in front of you. It's not the time to separate. And divide. And so he commends them for their faith, the growth of it exceedingly. Charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. And I think this is all because of this tribulation. Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you in the assemblies of God for your patience. Now, patience, they're noted for their patience, which means it must, it's in the process of being tried. Otherwise, it wouldn't be notable. And faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. So Paul explicitly declares that they were then under severe persecution and tribulation and that they were presently enduring these great tribulations that is actually producing in them spiritually much fruit. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye, ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. They are being made worthy through these tribulations, and they are suffering in these tribulations. It's very real to them. So you're going to have to, if you're going to make out that chapter 2's tribulations are different, then you're going to have to uh, pretty much go with the idea that, well, your, your, your tribulation is you know, it's pretty serious and everything, but there's another tribulation 2,000 years later. You're going to have to imagine he's doing that. Maybe I shouldn't have planted that thought in your mind because then you read it in the text, but I find it hard to read in the text once you're trying to read it neutrally without trying not to have any agenda either way. They're suffering. 
They're suffering uh, persecution and tribulation. They're enduring it and it's producing a lot of fruit in their lives spiritually. Verse 6. And they do suffer, right? That's verse 5. Verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Paul is saying it is a righteous thing, and you can take a solace in this. God is going to bring tribulation to the people that are bringing tribulation to you now. Your tribulation is of such a nature, God is going to intervene and bring it on their heads, but you're going to have to stand fast until he does. That sounds like they're in the middle of a real tribulation. Well, yeah. Again, verse 6, seeing as a righteous thing for God to recompense tribulation, to them that trouble you. And it's a tribulation they're going through then. Verse 7, And to you who are troubled, to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 7, he says, And to you who are troubled, who is the you of verse 7? That would have to be the Christians at Thessalonica in the first century. And these Christians at Thessalonica in the first century are currently troubled and under severe persecution and tribulation. But he says, take solace in this. Rest with us. Now when he says in verse 7, And to you who are presently troubled, rest with us. Now when he says us, he's meaning and including most certainly himself. And whether he means it in that broad way like, uh, Come with us, I'll show you. And you actually mean yourself, but you use the plural. It's a mode of speech, right? Sort of a formal way. Oftentimes you do it if you're someone that's in a position of leadership. It's different nuances to it. But certainly, no matter how you look at it, Paul's included in that. So, you who are troubled, rest with us. Paul also was suffering persecution, and had been all during this time. He's writing this from Corinth, and we already know from our Wednesday night studies the stuff he's been going through. We just concluded, wait a minute, he's the New Testament Jeremiah. And he's basically saying, take solace in this, because you can rest with us. How? When? When? when the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed. Now, is he saying, you're suffering terrible now, but rest with us? Because thousands of years down the road, after you've already been dead and resting in the grave. Well, that's... I suppose there's a form of solace there. Isn't the solace more profound if I will intervene and stop these men and judge them, and you'll live to see it? Okay. Okay. All right, yeah, okay. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to belabor this because we've been going through this language extensively in Matthew 24. And it can easily be understood as Christ's apocalyptic Old Testament style judgment on Jerusalem in 70 A.D. In Matthew 24, we're told that he would come, and he would come with his angels, and they would gather together his elect. And we went through all those phrases. We we duplicated the phrases and the idea and the language in multiple texts in the Old Testament. And if you didn't know that, that wouldn't even be an option here. Maybe in and of itself, that doesn't demand that you believe that verse 7 and 8 is... Apocalyptic language. I agree, in and of itself. That's why you have to look at all the evidence, the whole picture. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance of them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ would come in the first century, in that generation, as he said, the generation, and by the way, who we already know from Matthew 24, that the abomination of desolation must come in the lifetime of the disciples Jesus was speaking to. And most people understand the abomination of desolation as being the man of sin and or the beast. 
So by very nature of what we've already covered in Matthew 24, without any other knowledge, we're driven here to, con- to consider, well, the man of sin had the, the, I mean, the abomination of desolation had to have come in the first century if Matthew 24 makes any sense. And unless you're going to live with some contradictions and pretend they're not there, which is what most Christians are doing, and then the people that don't want to pretend, like C.S. Lewis or Bertrand Russell and all these other fellows, they say, hey, we got a problem here. They're just willing to say what you don't want to admit. But why should we be scared? We believe God's word. We believe the authority of God's word. So that the Lord, in prophetic language, oftentimes comes in judgment on the clouds, on the wings of a chariot, and smoke is coming out of his nostrils and fire, and he comes and brings fire and brimstone, and the rivers turn into pitch, and all this stuff... And you come to find out, well, that didn't actually literally happen. This is that oriental apocalyptic language. It's the same thing here. And the only reason I say that, do many things happen in the Bible prophetically literally? Yes. But the only reason I would say that here is because of the context. This man of sin, the abomination of desolation. If that didn't happen 2,000 years ago, then you've got to take Daniel 9, snip it like the dispensationalist, and take the 490 years, and take the caboose and put it way over here. And it's not 490 years. The prophecy is a big joke. It's like over 2,000 years. And it just, you know, they have an agenda. I'm not willing to do that. i got to interpret the Bible as it's given. And not only just live with it, make peace with it, and see the blessing of it. And sometimes that's the last phase you get to because you're fighting with yourself, you know. I'm not saying that the Lord Jesus Christ won't come with fire and judgment in our future. I'm saying here the context is the man of sin. And even if someone wants to say, well, I think it'll happen twice. Okay, well, you got to admit first it happened once. Or else you're, you're denying the Bible, see. So this apocalyptic language of Christ, Christ coming in judgment, obviously to destroy the man of sin, which he's going to talk about, he's going to do in chapter 2. And Christ did it. We'll talk about that when we, if we have the time. Um, and obviously, this is uh, a description of him coming to destroy uh, their enemies, and their enemies at Thessalonica would be... Um, working under the authority of the Roman system, and the head of the Roman system that would initiate the tribulation would be Nero. Now, i got more to say in Nero. We, we know the man of sin to be Nero. Um, so this is driving us to the first century. But then in verse 9 and 10, we read this. Who shall... So, well, let me read verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance, and then that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now, you could take verses 9 and 10 in two ways. You could take it as um, in the future judgment of all the world. In other words, God's going to take vengeance on the Thessalonians and judge them and destroy them. He's going to come and destroy the man of sin in their day and in their age. But they're also going to be punished because it says who shall be punished. So it's future. But in all honesty, it's future from Paul saying it. So even 70 AD would still be future from Paul saying it. Or it could technically also be a reference to thousands of years later at the end of of time and the, and a uh, universal judgment, and that that's being included. That's not going to advance the argument one way or the other. I mean, I think people can have different opinions in that. I don't think it's going to... I'm not interested in answering that so much because it doesn't really affect what we're talking about. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day which, again, you could read into his uh, apocalyptic coming then or in the future. Verse 11, Wherefore we also pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling. You know, it, it, that's how bad the tribulation is, that they're being, uh, Paul's prayers that they be made worthy through this calling, that they, be, that they would be, count, that God would count you worthy of this calling. It's an honor, Paul's saying, to die for Christ. 
Are you worthy of this calling? What's the calling he's talking about? The tribulation they're in. Are you worthy to suffer for Christ? It's so far afield from how many think. But that's the thinking of faith. Wherefore, we also pray always for you. Who's Paul praying for? He's not praying for you and I that we'll be counted worthy of a tribulation in our future. He's praying for them that they would be counted worthy of the tribulation that they're entering into and are in. And fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Verse 12, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul uh, thus will pray for the Thessalonians then. That's what he's doing in verses 11 and 12. He's praying for them. And Paul uh, uh And Paul's desire is that they, not you and I, but that they would be counted worthy of this calling. What is the calling? To enter into this tribulation, which they are now in to some degree. And it's serious. And in verse 12, he says that the name and all this, that you would suffer this tribulation and be counted worthy so that the name of Jesus would be glorified, he says, in you, in you. Verse 12, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. That's not you and I in the Thessalonians. So there is no chapter division. Chapter 1 flows into chapter 2, right? And what he's saying in chapter 2 is premised on what he's been saying, okay? And uh, are they really different tribulations? Let's just keep reading. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So see, he changes the subject. He's talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he was doing that also uh, in verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. The coming, the apocalyptic coming of Christ. This generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. The day of Christ is at hand. There are some here that will uh, not, you'll not finish going over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Or there are some standing here that will not taste of death till you see me come in the power of my kingdom. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. And don't be fooled by that either. In Matthew 24, Jesus talked about the angels will come and gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth. And we went through that phrase. And I showed you how many times that phrase about gathering together is used. And it's not meant about a physical gathering. Oh, we're all going to gather you in one spot in the rapture. We're going to go up in cloud seven to the left, you know. No, it's that gathering, like Jesus said, Oh, Israel, I would have, as a, as, a mother, as a mother hen, I would have gathered my chicks together and draw you under my wings. But you wouldn't come. I long to gather you together. And we looked at many te- passages using that exact phrase. And it was never meant to be like a physical relocation. Now, if you understand it that way, I beseech you, brethren, by the uh, coming of uh, Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. You're gathering unto him by faith. For the chicks to come and be under his wings means to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of a living God. And that he died on the cross for our sins. Now, in regards to that, Paul says, I'm worried that you're thinking incorrectly, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, that's an apostasy, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So let's get the context here. In chapter 1, Paul is acknowledging the extreme tribulation that they're going through, the persecution that they're suffering. He also commends them for the spiritual growth that they've received from it, but he's acknowledging the magnitude of their suffering. And he says that he will pray for them. But don't worry, take heed, take solace in this. The Lord will give you rest because the Lord will come in his, in his, in his anger with vengeance upon your enemies. Not only is he going to destroy Nero, 
and the, the Roman persecution of God's people through Nero. But he's also going to destroy pot B of their enemy, Mystery Babylon, which is Jerusalem, because most of the persecution that up to that point had come from the Romans came at the instigation of the Jews. We've been seeing that in the book of Acts. These Jews were chasing Paul around as Paul went around the countryside with, with uh, his associates, and they'd chase him, and then they'd stir up the opposition in the town, and it would be a Roman town, but it would be the Jews chasing Paul, stirring up trouble, and then they'd go to stone him or to do something. And so the, the Jews were still continuing to get the Romans agitated to persecute the Christians. And the opposition was coming from the Jewish quarter, but it was coming from the hands of the Romans, which is what they did to Jesus too. So Mystery Babylon works in conjunction with the beast of Rome. And then, in Revelation, we found after the fact, Rome turns on, the beast turns on Mystery Babylon and destroys her. Did not Rome destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD? Yes. And here, we're being told in the second chapter of Second Thessalonians, the Lord Jesus Christ would turn around and then destroy the beast, which he did when he killed Nero. Now, we'll get into that a little bit more, the, the timing of that, how perfect it works out. It's actually, it's so succinct, uh, it would be hard to duplicate it even uh, in make-believe scenarios. Um, So here in chapter 2, in the first three verses, Paul says, look, concerning the Lord coming to judge your enemies, which is what I've been talking about in chapter 1, he's going to give you a reprieve, he's going to destroy your enemies. Uh, Don't be worried as if the day of Christ is at hand, that day when he comes to do it is at hand. Because before that day can actually come, there has to be an apostasy, and then the man of sin has to be revealed. That day doesn't technically and actually come until the man of sin is revealed. So that's his basic argument. Everybody from all stripes agrees on that. What that means is where the disagreement comes in, okay? Now, I'm going to show you something that's shocking. (laughs) And maybe the, the degree to which it is shocking I will not make plain to you in this one sermon. Maybe I shouldn't even do this now because I'm kind of jumping the gun, but it still goes to the question we're asking. Can John Hagee be right? I mean, the man of sin is alive now? No. No. He's going to be made manifest on August 30th. So we see in verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, maybe a word of prophecy, nor by letter as as from us. Did someone send a false letter to the Thessalonians pretending that Paul wrote it, signed it with his name, saying that Christ has already come and don't be deceived by whatever it is that's making you think this way? What were they thinking? They were thinking that the day of Christ is at hand. And Paul's saying, no, the day of Christ can't come until the man of sin be revealed. But wait a minute, I want you to stop and think about what the Thessalonians were thinking. They were thinking the day of Christ was at hand. But you've got to understand what's being said there exactly. The Greek word that is translated at hand is anestikin. Anestikin is the word. Anestikin means to come, to be at hand, or present. Like present, presently, right now. That's the word. Now, here's the interesting thing. Now, listen very carefully. This is very important. And the full import of it, you know, I don't think you'll get all of it today. But an eftikin is a verb. And it's in the perfect tense. Um, It's perfect. It's indicative. It's active. Well, forget the other two. That doesn't so much address what we're concerned with. It's in the perfect tense as a Greek verb. You can just look it up in any lexicon, and they'll give you the tenses of the word. Okay, there it is. Okay. You say, so what? Well, the perfect tense of a Greek verb. Always, 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 always is revealing to us by virtue of being in that tense. It is revealing to us that the action of the verb, was completed in the past, but has consequences in the present. 
It's like a twofold revelation. The action was completed in the path, and the consequences are here in the present. Um, Paul's saying, don't worry, don't be thinking that the day of Christ has already come. That's what he's saying to them. Don't be thinking that the day of Christ has come and therefore we're living in the present reality of that past event. That's what he's dealing with when he's talking to the Thessalonians. When you read at hand in your Bible here, the King James translators put that, what they're really driving at is, look, don't be thinking that the man of sin is already come and the reality of his coming is now what you're living with, the present, uh, the present reality amongst us. Uh, that the day of Christ is now here because he came yesterday, the day of Christ is here. See, that kind of thing. And someone says, well, is that really an accurate translation of this? Oh, I don't want you to take my word for it. I'm no expert, but I'm sincere. And that means I want to know, see? Now, again, the full import of this, it might not be striking you. <laughs> Actually, you could do a whole sermon on the full import. But let me give you, now, I've done this before for you. If I give you modern translations, I'm not doing that to say if the modern translations gang up in the King James and seem to differ, then the King James must be wrong. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe even the King James is wrong. The King James is saying at hand in the sense it is present amongst us because he came in the past. Now, that that's an accurate understanding, and it must be the understanding because without question, no controversy, it's a perfect tense verb. Listen to the modern translations. For instance, here's the New International Version. Not to become easily unsettled or alarmed. You know, they get their other translations, you know. Not to become un easily, easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come already come is how they translated it by the way a lot of them make the substitution of day of the lord instead of day of christ because the the modern uh the the new manuscripts that they discovered which makes them so holy and 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 know so much more than uh, the king james translators they have the word lord instead of christ but the the greek text that the uh, texas receptus was based on has the day of christ see it's it's an accurate translation but that's not the subject matter the subject matter is don't be worried as if the day of the Christ or the day of the Lord, because the day of the Lord and the day of Christ is the same thing. Uh, don't be worried as if the day of Christ is at hand. And the New International Version has already come. And the New Living Translation has already begun, they translate it. In the English Standard Version, the ESV, that the day of the Lord has come. See, past tense. In the Berean Study, Study Bible, the day of the Lord has already come. In the Berean Literal Bible, that the day of the Lord is present. See, many of the translations will translate it like it's already come past, and some of them will translate it like it's here present. And both of them are right. They've got a complicated thing in English to translate this concept of a, um, a perfect tense Greek verb, uh, particularly in an active voice, which is uh, hard, that's hard to do in English. So one says it one way, one says it the other way. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that in a second. Uh, Berean Literal Bible, Amer the New American Standard Bible, the day of the Lord has come. Um, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, day of the Lord has come. The International Standard Version, day of the Lord has already come. The NET Bible, day of the Lord is already here. The Aramaic Bible in plain English, the Lord has arrived. God's Word translation, already come. New American Standard, the Lord has already come. Darby, oh, who cares what Darby says? English Revised, well, who cares what any of these say, really? But uh, Darby says, the Lord is present. Uh, English Revised Version, the Lord is now present. The Weymouth New Testament, the Lord is now here. The World English Bible, the Christ has come. The Young's Literal Translation, some people go to that. Young's Literal tra Translation, as that the day of Christ hath arrived. The only other 
version I ever really said, you know, is nice and safe to use is the, the, the King James 3, uh, which is J. Green. And he's using the text the King James used, and that's why I like it. And he's trying to modernize it and be more literal. He corrects the when the Tetragrammaton is used, remember? And the King James makes the substitution like the Jews did. He puts it the way it was written. That is correct to do. So I admire this Bible. It's just, it's so literal, it's awkward for public reading. It's just very literal and using the proper text. And what does J. Green say in the King James 3 Bible? Uh, for, I'll just read the whole verse. For you, for you not to be quickly shaken in the mind, nor to be disturbed, neither through a spirit, nor through speech, nor through letter, as through us, that the day of Christ has come. I had other ones I didn't bother bringing them because I didn't, I didn't have time. Exposit is Greek New Testament, same thing. They wrote, uh, we're already present. The Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges, blah, blah. Oh, I've got this too. Jameson Fawcett Brown, which is the commentary you gave me for a Christmas present one time. It's the one that was highly recommended by Charles Spurgeon. And he says, uh, is at hand, he's quoting Second Thessalonians 2 2, is at hand. And then he quotes the Greek word, um, rather as in Romans 8.38, 1 Corinthians uh, 3.22, uh, Galatians 1.4, is present. See, he's, he's saying that means is present. Christ and his apostles always taught that the Lord's coming is at hand. It is not likely that Paul would imply anything contrary. Think about that. We're reading in 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, don't be worried as if the day of Christ is at hand. But Jesus was always teaching that his coming was at hand. Is Paul denying what Jesus taught? So obviously Paul isn't meaning at hand the way that Christ was using it. He's using it in a different way. And we have this perfect tense verb usage, which means it's already come. That's different. It's not likely that Paul would imply anything contrary to what Christ taught. What he denies is that it is so imminent, immediately imminent or present as to justify the neglect of everyday duties. Okay. And just so, you know, you might as well hear it from the horse's mouth. And the horse's mouth um, is J. Gresham Mation. Now, J. Gresham Mation is like, you know, particularly amongst the Reformed and real sober thinkers. He was the Greek scholar of yesteryear, the guy that you go to to learn New Testament Greek in so many Reformed schools. Pastor Gugini, you know, he and I went through this book, and he gave me the book, and and we use this, it's New Testament Greek for beginners. Uh, and I, I just thought, well, oh, did I lose my place? I took that paper out. <sighs> Wait a minute, I might be able to find it. I had it marked with a paper. Oh, it's really worth reading, too. I'm going to look one more time here. Talk amongst yourselves, entertain yourselves. I wanted to read, uh, first I wanted to read his definition of the present tense. Here we go. This is what J. Gresham Mason says in his book on learning Greek. He's saying, the Greek perfect tense denotes the present state, present. The, the Greek perfect tense denotes the present state resultant upon a past action. So it's something, the action was completed in the past, and it has a present tense consequence. There's a dual thing going on there. And then he makes an interesting observation. Now, I told you that was like an active voice, but there's a perfect uh, perfect passive uh, likewise. He says the perfect passive is often much easier to translate into English than the perfect active. You have the perfect active in Second Thessalonians 2 too. But that doesn't make a difference really. What he's going to say, you're going to get the point. He, he, he talks about a Greek word which means it is written, talking about the scriptures. It is written, you know, thus saith the Lord. So you have a Greek word and it's translated, it is written. Now listen to his observation. Here the English, it is written, is not a present tense at all, but reproduces the Greek perfectly, uh, perfect. <laughs> Let me read that again. Here the English, it is written, quote unquote, is not a present tense at all but reproduces the Greek perfect very well. 
The meaning is, it stands written. Both English and Greek here refer to a present state resultant upon an act of writing which took place long ago. So when you're reading, it is written, it sounds like, well, you know, like it's like it's being written now. No, no, no. It was written in the past. But it is written, it has present consequences. That's what's being communicated when you read in Second Thessalonians 2, 2, that what the Thessalonians were believing. They were believing that the, the day of Christ had already come and was now presently amongst them because he had in the past already come. Now, that they were thinking that has consequences, theologically. You say, but they were mistaken in their notion. That doesn't make a difference. There's, con- yeah, I agree, but there's consequences to the fact that they were thinking that. Um, and we have no time for the consequences. <laughs> um, if the tribulation, I'll just say this, we'll have to leave it here. Um, if the tribulation being spoken of in chapter 1 and 2, um, if that tribulation is still in our future, then how could the Thessalonians have been experiencing it in their day as Paul is strongly suggesting by the flow of chapter 1 and chapter 2. You would have to say, oh, they're utterly two different tribulations. As they're in the middle of their own tribulation, Paul gets sidetracked and starts talking about the trouble you and I are going to have before August 30th. Well, that's really not of much con- uh, concern to them when they're in the middle of their own hassles. We all, all of a sudden he starts talking about, yeah, well, you got problems. Well, these people are going to have problems too. Let me tell you the detail about what they're going to... Well, wait a minute now. You know, that's sort of an odd way to encourage them. But if you read this with zero prejudice and zero agenda, the one flows into the other perfectly. But, however, if this tribulation is future, you can't read it that way, that most natural way, where Paul is actually being a blessing to them. He's encouraging them. Don't worry, the Lord's going to put a stop to what's happening. (laughs) They were suffering a tribulation then, and that is why they thought, that the day of Christ had finally arrived. They were suffering, and they were in that tribulation. And I'll leave you with this thought. Jump to verse 7. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Well, I guess according to John Hagee, he's been working a long time. The Lord's not very effective, certainly somewhat tardy, And it doesn't really offer them any comfort in their lifetimes. But brethren, that can't be the meaning. So I said to you, why does John Hagee say August 30th? You don't, I wasn't just being a wise aleck when I said, who cares? You see what, there's an actual theological prudence to that answer. I said it maybe in a wise cracking way, but the idea I literally mean without having a wise cracking attitude And I mean to say, who cares about how he came up with that? The whole premise is wrong is the idea. If we're believing the Bible, if you want to go on traditions and what's popular in thinking nowadays, then I'll, I become a laughing stock. They can write me off. All they got to do is take a few excerpts of things I say out of context, quote them to their people, and they can blackball me so fast. I'm a nutcase who's gone off the deep end. But how do you deny what's in Scripture? We did the same thing when we looked at the the dating of the book of Revelation. All these, even great men, said obviously, Revelation was written in the 90s, 90-some A.D. And they quote historical evidence of someone who said it like 300 years after the fact. And they hang it all on that one thing. Was it Eusebius? I forget. Um... But then uh, we went to the Bible, and we saw from the Bible in the book of Revelation, it's demanding a writing in the book of Revelation that had to be before 70 A.D. from internal evidence in the Scripture. I can quote some guy in 400 A.D. who says, uh, the, the, the Revelation was written in 92 A.D. Or I can go to the Scripture, which demands that we believe it was written while the temple was still standing, and that has way more authority. It's God's word. And that's how I want to argue. 
Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we stand amazed and in awe of the perfection and holiness of your word. And Lord, we don't always, and we don't even now, fully grasp and understand all that is contained therein. Paul said we wouldn't. He said that we'd see through a glass darkly. So our goal isn't really even to understand everything. We know we won't come to that. Our goal should be that we understand aright that which thou hast revealed, that we not contradict your word. And when your word requires of us a belief that confuses prior construction of theology or eschatology, but yet we know what your word is saying, then we must make peace with your word and rethink our own construction of theology or eschatology. We do know that Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior and the judge of all the world, and all men must stand before him and give an account, and he is the universal judge of mankind. And without him, there is no salvation. And we do know that his word is perfect and holy and will not pass away every jot and tittle. And help us, Father, to believe in the jots and the tittles and to not overstate them. And the things that we can't know, may we stay away. We can contemplate, we can meditate, we can wait for further light. But the things we absolutely should know, no matter how they affect us, may we believe them because... It comes from thee. We thank thee for thy word. Help us to revere it and to honor it, and in so doing, honor Christ and all that he has done, because he is the centerpiece of everything that has been written. And we thank thee for him and his salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.